The existence of God, quite possibly, is both the most debated and the most fascinating philosophical question. It deserves a central place in this course, moreover, because of the prominent role of God in the philosophy of Thomas Aquinas. But before we get into the finer points of Aquinas' arguments for God's existence, we should begin by considering just what are the possible philosophical positions one might have on this all-important matter. First, let us consider atheism, or the belief that God does not exist. People choose to be atheists for a number of reasons. A minority of atheists actually believe they can demonstrate through one argument or another that God does not exist. But the majority of atheists are less bold. Admitting they cannot prove the non-existence of God, they argue that because God's existence cannot be proven either, it follows that atheism is the most reasonable position. This is because, they argue, the burden of proof is on the believer, not upon the skeptic. In other words, in the absence of evidence one way or the other, the most reasonable thing to do is to assume the being in question, God, does not exist. These kinds of atheists are more common, and their position is well worth considering. Most people will recognize the burden of proof as a legal expression. In a criminal court, the burden of proof lies upon the prosecution, not upon the defense attorney. But why is this so? Is it because the defendant, before any evidence is presented, is more likely to be innocent than guilty? Not at all. It's not that placing the burden of proof on the prosecutor makes it more likely for the court to get it right. The burden of proof is on the prosecutor because we consider it a greater injustice for an innocent person to be punished than for a guilty person to go free. If somehow a defendant's life, freedom, or reputation did not hang in the balance, and the only question before the court was getting to the most likely truth of the case, there would be no reason to place the burden of proof on the prosecution or the defense. There would be most likely a shared burden of proof. Each side would make its case, and if neither one presented compelling evidence, the most reasonable position would simply be to withhold judgment. This shared burden of proof is how things are with respect to the existence of God. Of course, we will soon see that there are very compelling arguments for God's existence. But even if there were no such compelling arguments either way, the most one could conclude would be agnosticism, not atheism. But why do atheists place the burden of proof on believers? Admittedly, doing so at first seems to make a lot of sense. Imagine that a university science professor devoted an entire lecture to describing a prehistoric sea turtle with six legs. He goes on and on about this animal's habitat, its diet, its likely predators, its mating habits, and so on. Then, finally, at the end of the lecture, a student raises her hand and asks the professor what evidence there is that this prehistoric turtle actually existed, to which he responds, well, how do you know it didn't exist? We would naturally laugh at the professor for failing to recognize that the burden of proof is upon him. Why? According to many atheists, it's for no other reason than that he is the one making an existence claim. In fact, this particular professor has committed the logical fallacy of an appeal to ignorance, which is assuming that something is true simply because it cannot be proven false. As the argument goes, therefore, just as the nutty professor must accept the burden of proof for being the one making an existence claim, so also the believer in God must accept not just his equal share of the burden of proof, but the entire burden of proof. We must question, though, whether a person must accept the burden of proof merely for being the one making an existence claim. This may be true in the case of the six-legged prehistoric sea turtle, but is it always the case? Consider the example of intelligent life elsewhere in the universe, for which there is likewise no evidence one way or the other. Does the one who claims there is intelligent life elsewhere in the universe have any greater burden of proof than the one who denies that such life exists? 
Clearly not. Most reasonable people, including a great many atheists, would say that if no evidence exists one way or the other on this question, the best response is simply to withhold judgment. We don't place the burden of proof on the believer in this case simply because he's making an existence claim. So why would we place the burden of proof entirely on the one who believes in God? Is not the example of intelligent life in the universe far more analogous to the existence of God than to that of a prehistoric sea turtle? This is not to say that the believer should place the burden of proof entirely upon the atheist either. This is precisely the reason for affirming a shared burden of proof. When the burden of proof is shared, the most reasonable response in the absence of good arguments either way is, like in the case of extraterrestrial intelligent life, to withhold judgment, or agnosticism. Atheists don't generally like agnosticism because they take the claim that God exists to be so extraordinary, so fantastical, that one must either produce some rational evidence for those claims or reject them entirely. The well-known 20th century atheist philosopher Bertrand Russell famously likened belief in God to the ridiculous belief in a teapot orbiting the sun. As he said, quote, if I were to suggest that between the Earth and Mars there is a China teapot revolving around the Sun in an elliptical orbit, nobody would be able to disprove my assertion, provided I were careful to add that the teapot is too small to be revealed even by our most powerful telescopes. But if I were to go on to say that, since my assertion cannot be disproved, it is intolerable presumption on the part of human reason to doubt it, I should rightly be thought to be talking nonsense. End of quote. Russell's analogy is, of course, absurd, and for two reasons. If one truly considers it, it becomes obvious that the reason we quite justifiably deny the existence of a teapot orbiting the sun is not simply the fact that we lack evidence of such a thing, but the fact that we possess evidence that there is no such thing. Speaking more broadly, we reject Russell's teapot, not because of what we don't know, but because of what we do know. We know that teapots are, by definition, artifacts, and that artifacts are made by some form of intelligence. We also have good reason to believe that no such artifact has been launched into orbit by us or anyone else on Earth. Not only because we lack direct knowledge of such an absurd scenario— but because we know that no nation or institution capable of launching such a teapot would have any reason for doing so. If it's suggested that extraterrestrials might have launched the teapot, we also know this is exceedingly unlikely, because any extraterrestrial with the rational and technological capacity to do such a thing would also have the rational capacity to discover its pointlessness, and so on. Again, the point is quite obvious. We reject the existence of Russell's teapot for reasons far beyond the simple fact that we don't have any evidence for it. Matters are entirely different, however, when considering the existence of something for which we are truly without evidence one way or the other. Now, of course, I'm not suggesting that God falls into this category. As we will see shortly and in the coming lectures, there are very good reasons to believe that God exists. What I'm arguing now, though, is that even if there were no such reasons, it would be unjustified to conclude atheism. At most, one could only conclude agnosticism. When it comes to the existence of God, like the existence of intelligent life elsewhere in the universe, we may follow the common saying that absence of evidence does not result in evidence of absence. The fact that the burden of proof is not squarely on the believer's shoulders has, of course, not prevented Christians, not to mention also Muslims and Jews, from providing arguments for the existence of God. One of the most famous of these arguments was developed in the 12th century by St. Anselm of Canterbury, and it has come to be known in modern times, with the help of Immanuel Kant, as the ontological argument. Anselm's argument is essentially as follows. Premise 1. Everyone, even the most hardened atheists, can formulate a concept of God, 
defined as a being than which nothing greater can be conceived. Premise 2. A being than which nothing greater can be conceived, by definition, possesses every possible perfection. Otherwise, it would not be a being than which nothing greater can be conceived, but a being than which something still greater can be conceived. Thus, a being than which nothing greater can be conceived would have to be perfectly just, all-knowing, supremely powerful, beautiful, wise, etc. Premise 3. In addition to these other perfections, a being than which nothing greater can be conceived must also have existence, since to lack existence would be to lack something the having of which would make that thing still more perfect. Premise 4. Since, therefore, by the term God we mean nothing more than a being than which nothing greater can be conceived, it follows that God possesses the quality of existence. Conclusion, therefore, God exists. To be sure, it's difficult to consider this argument all the way through without getting the feeling that you've been tricked. Nevertheless, this argument has endured through the centuries and continues to have diehard supporters even today. In his Critique of Pure Reason, Immanuel Kant famously attacked the argument with the assertion that, quote, being or existence is obviously not a real predicate. By this he meant that, even if one grants that we must ascribe every possible perfection to a being than which nothing greater can be conceived, we would not thereby have to ascribe existence to that being. This is because Kant reasoned, Existence is not a predicate, like justice, power, beauty, or knowledge. Rather than a predicate, it is the foundation or precondition of all predicates. If a thing has no existence, in other words, there can be no mention of any real predicates at all. For this reason, it's incorrect to say that an infinitely perfect being must have existence, just as we would say it must have justice. Existence, argued Kant, does not make a thing more perfect, it simply makes it real. Much of what Kant said is true, but it goes too far to say that existence is not a predicate. In fact, it is. As we saw in the last lecture, to say that something exists is, indeed, to predicate something of that thing, namely existence. This is really not radically different than to predicate wisdom, courage, or redness of a thing. Some might even argue that to predicate anything of anything, we're already presupposing existence, so that to mention existence as a predicate is simply redundant. But this is also clearly false. To say that unicorns exist is not redundant. In fact, most of us would consider it quite surprising. To say that something exists is to say that that thing is real, or that it has existence in reality, as opposed to existence merely in our minds or imaginations. In this case, to deny that existence is a real predicate, a real characteristic of things, is a great mistake. But does this mean that St. Anselm's argument for the existence of God is persuasive? Thomas Aquinas famously rejects this argument. As he would say, even if we grant that existence must be a characteristic of the infinitely perfect being in our minds, it does not follow that that being has existence outside of our minds. In other words, a being than which nothing greater can be conceived may indeed have existence as one of its properties, but it remains a property of a being that exists in the mind. To see this, consider the fact that one may imagine two distinct beings. The first is a being that is perfect in every conceivable way, with the exception that it does not really exist. The second is a being that is perfect in every conceivable way, period, including existence. One must see that even this second being need not exist in reality. It only has to have existence as a property of the thing existing in my mind. Thomas Aquinas, in criticizing Anselm's argument, puts it this way, quote, Granted that everyone understands by this word God 
is signified something than which nothing greater can be thought. Nevertheless, it does not therefore follow that he understands that what the word signifies exists actually, but only that it exists mentally. Nor can it be argued that it actually exists unless it be admitted that there actually exists something than which nothing greater can be thought. And this is precisely what is not admitted by those who hold that God does not exist. End of quote. This failure, of course, should not lead us to conclude that there are no good arguments for God's existence, or that the only way to know God's existence is through blind faith. In fact, according to Thomas Aquinas, Anselm offers us an ideal starting point for how to begin thinking about making an argument for God's existence that is truly persuasive. At one point in his Summa Theologiae, Thomas poses the question, whether the existence of God is self-evident. It's a fascinating question, primarily because St. Thomas means something very unique by the term self-evident. By this term, he does not mean what we ordinarily mean when we say that the nose on our face, the brick wall right in front of us, or perhaps the corruption in the government is self-evident. Thomas uses the term in a more technical way. For him, a claim is only self-evident if the predicate is somehow already contained in the subject. So, for example, the following claims would be self-evident on his understanding. All bachelors are unmarried. A square has four sides. A triangle has 180 degrees. These statements are self-evident because they cannot be false. To know what a bachelor is, is to know that he must necessarily be unmarried. To know what a triangle is, is to know that it must necessarily have 180 degrees. In short, so long as we can comprehend the concept that the subject refers to in these statements, we automatically know that the statements must be true. Now, as Thomas explains, this leads directly to the interesting question as to whether the statement God exists is self-evident. If it is self-evident in the way St. Thomas means, the concept of God would include the concept of existence, in the same way that the concept of triangularity includes the concept of three-sidedness. Existence, in other words, would be part of the very concept of God, this, of course, is what Anselm believed. God, as a being than which nothing greater can be conceived, must have existence as a property by definition. To know what God is, is also to know that he exists. What's important to understand is that Thomas Aquinas does not disagree with Anselm's claim that God's existence is self-evident. But he does add a crucial distinction not in Anselm's original argument. Thomas Aquinas distinguishes between something that is self-evident only in itself and something that is self-evident in itself and to us. The examples just given are examples of the second kind. That a square has four sides is self-evident in itself because the concept of four-sidedness is contained in the concept of squareness. It is also self-evident to us because we are able to comprehend and do comprehend the essence of squareness. Consider the example of the following statement, though. A shiliagon has 1,000 sides. This statement, too, is self-evident in itself because a shiliagon is, by definition, a 1,000-sided polygon. But it is not self-evident to the vast majority of people who are unaware of what a shiliagon is. Once we discover what a shiliagon is, and are able to comprehend its nature, the statement then becomes self-evident to us as well. This is why St. Thomas argues that the existence of God is self-evident in itself, but not to us. In other words, he agrees with Anselm that the essence of God 
necessarily includes existence, just as it includes goodness, justice, perfection, etc. But this is not something that is immediately apparent. To see that the nature of God necessarily includes existence, one would have to do one of two things. Come to know the essence of God so thoroughly as simply to see that this is true, something no mere finite mind can do. Or one would have to demonstrate that God exists by other means, which also shows that existence is part of his nature. Since the first is impossible for any finite intellect, Thomas Aquinas opts for the second. God's existence can be proven, he insists, even to the extent of proving that existence is part of God's nature, but it cannot be done, as Anselm attempted, simply by analyzing the idea of God. Arguments of that sort, St. Thomas labels propter quid, which may be translated something like, according to the thing itself. So, by an argument propter quid, we might demonstrate that all triangles must have 180 degrees, or that a whole must be greater than any of its parts, or that all bachelors must be unmarried. God's existence, on the other hand, if it can be demonstrated at all, must be demonstrated quia, which St. Thomas identifies as reasoning from effect to cause. By an argument quia, for example, one might argue that the butler must have committed the murder because he was the only one with the means and the motive and his fingerprints were all over the murder weapon. Similarly, we might reason that it rained between the time that we went to bed and the time we woke up if we look out the window in the morning and see puddles all over the street. Quia reasoning moves, as it were, in the opposite direction as the course of events themselves. As the rain came before the puddles, our perception of the puddles comes before our conclusion of the rain. As the butler's wielding his weapon was the cause of his fingerprints on that weapon, our discovery of those fingerprints is the cause of our conclusion that he is the killer. This is, Thomas Aquinas insists, how God's existence can be known by human beings. As St. Paul urged in the Bible, quote, Since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made. End of quote. Our reasoning should not, like Anselm's, begin with God's existence, but should rather, St. Thomas argues, conclude with God's existence. Where we must begin is with things that are more knowable, more understandable, to us, namely created things. This same pattern of reasoning lies at the heart of all of St. Thomas Aquinas' arguments for the existence of God. Each one of them stands or falls on the notion that creation implies, in various ways, the existence of a creator. In this sense, we must be prepared to reason, not like a mathematician, but like a detective piecing clues together. As we will see in the coming lectures, St. Thomas Aquinas believes that there are five principal ways of demonstrating God's existence, using nothing but ordinary observation combined with philosophical argument. It is important to understand, however, that all five of these arguments fall into the category of what St. Thomas calls arguments quia, that is, they all begin with the physical or sensible world. In other words, they all focus upon some aspect of creation that, considered properly, leads us back to the existence of God as creation's source. <laughs>